Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Is the public getting its information about the paranormal entirely from popular television shows and movies on the subject? If so, what does this do to serious scholarship in the field? What does it do to our own perception of who and what we are? Well, welcome to the 455th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Paul, and Ben has uh, either two or three more weeks left in the summer course that he's taking him away from the show on Monday evenings. But now, let's get right to our guest. Professor Lloyd Orbach is a leading global expert on ghosts and psychic experiences. He earned his undergraduate degree in cultural anthropology from Northwestern University in 1978 and a master's in parapsychology from John F. Kennedy Kennedy University in 1981. He is director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations, is a professor at both Atlantic University in Virginia and John F. Kennedy University in California. Uh, Okay, it's a heck of a commute. And creator of the Certificate Program in Parapsychological Studies at HCH Institute. He is the co-author with the late psychic medium Annette Martin of the book The Ghost Detective's Guide to Haunted San Francisco, published in 2011. He recently became president of the Forever Family Foundation and served on their scientific advisory board for several years. He is a member of the board of the Rhine Research Center and the advisory board of the Windbridge Institute. He was a consulting editor and columnist for Fate magazine in, from 1991 to 2004. And Lloyd's books include a paranormal casebook, Ghost Hunting in the New Millennium, Hauntings and Poltergeists, A Ghost Hunter's Guide, and Ghost Hunting, How to Investigate the Paranormal. His first book, ESP, Hauntings and Poltergeists, a Parapsychologist's Handbook, was published in 1986. His book, Reincarnation, Channeling, and Possession, a Parapsychologist's Handbook, is now available as an e-book for Amazon Kindle and Barnes & Noble Nook. On top of all that, he is also a professional mentalist and psychic entertainer, performing as Professor Paranormal. He has appeared widely in the national and international media, and unless we stop talking about him, we'll never get to him. His website, www.mindreader.com. Lloyd, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Paul. How are you doing? Pretty fair. Glad it's not as hot as it was in New England over the past few days. A little more comfortable today. Maybe you heard part of the yeah. forecast when you came on. We, we, we hit 100 this, uh, on Saturday as well. So. well. You live in California, don't you? I live in, the, in a valley east of San Francisco, and it gets pretty hot out here. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, being a foreigner, I wouldn't know that. Anyway, uh, let me just give our numbers this evening. If you'd like to call in, folks, uh, give us a ring locally at 401-766-1240 or from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, 800-449-1240. So, Lloyd, uh, do we have paranormal productions of unsurpassed quality on our television sets these days? Uh, Not that I've ever seen, at least not in this country. (laughs) I tend to agree. You know, it's been been a struggle. Television is always been a problem when it comes to trying to represent things properly regardless of the topic and you know science sometimes gets it right on tv but a lot of bad bad science shows up on television and we're unfortunately uh, the uh, recipient of both bad science and bad folklore at the Mm. same time yeah no i agree uh certainly we have to realize i'm sure that it, it is entertainment not necessarily education but nevertheless accuracy is something that I would always expect and hope for, but of course it's probably too much to hope for at this point. Um, which shows, would, I don't know, I don't want to get into necessarily naming different shows here mm-hmm. or whatever, but um, which ones would you say are the least disagreeable, if you can give a general idea? Probably the least disagreeable are a few that are on uh, biography where people are actually telling their own ghost stories, telling, talking about their own experiences. Uh, those are... You know, at least more interesting because at least you're getting a ghost story at that point. Yeah. And so there's one call, uh, one called um, Ghostly Encounters, which was from Canada originally, which is a really nice one. And even even the celebrity ghost stories isn't too bad. Uh, although I do wonder about some of the celebrities kind of exaggerating things a little bit. And, yeah. And then then there are a couple of shows that are pretty interesting when it comes to the mediums or psychics that are kind of doing their thing. But even then, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody recently about Teresa Caputo, who is a, the Long Island medium, and she is she's a phenomenal medium. But she doesn't really walk up to people on the street and start talking to them like she does in the TV show. And uh, the reality is any of us with a TV crew behind us could walk up to anybody and start talking about anything. Yeah. Without a TV crew, forget about it. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, well, I, I w- it's funny you should mention... Uh, 
the bio channel because we had Mark Phillips uh, on the show, uh, mm -hmm. My Ghost Story. He's the creator of that and executive producer, I believe. And I, I don't know, it's... Uh, And I asked him, I mean, haven't people had enough of, duh, did you hear that? And he agreed 100%. But, I mean, I, and, and his show, I think, from the few I've seen, I don't have a lot of time to watch television or movies. I kind of leave that to my son. But uh, but he did say that they do try to kind of be above the norm. And, when I, and I did watch that show, an episode or two, in preparation for his appearance. And I must say that I, I don't know if I'd use the word impressed, but, but uh, I wasn't depressed after <laughs> Yeah, after I mean, seeing it. Right, right. It's better, but I know of a couple of cases which have been definitely, you know, you, you end up with exaggeration. You end up with, uh, you know, unless they're really putting experts on to talk about what's actually going on in these cases, and the fact is they're not. Yeah. Well, one thing I did notice, too, uh, you know, as you say, is, is that because you, you have a camera in front of you and you're not a trained performer or broadcast person, And you're recounting an event like that, and I it's I don't know. I suppose there, there might be a temptation to to embellish a little bit. I don't know. And of course, I think the people are prisoners as well as as you say of of the folklore, bad folklore. Well, uh, yeah. I'm actually, frankly, less concerned about the people telling their story accurately than I am about the editors in the edit edit room uh, edit bays actually um, accurately editing in a way that represents the story correctly. That's very true. What? Oh, I don't even know what, how to even ask this, but I mean that, that's a very good point. Um, one cannot expect. Well, th th this is a problem in journalism in general. Right. I don't know if right. I'd include this in journalism, but as a 35-year newspaper, magazine type guy, I was um, always very, uh, very concerned that uh, many people. And I've lectured at journalism schools, and and, uh, and I've said, uh, and somebody, somebody will inevitably ask, uh, okay, if you have one word of advice. For the people in the class, what we know, who are, of course, the future reporters on television and, and in print, and I say one word of advice: read. And they kind of look at me. Read everything. Read the classics. Read newspapers and magazines, and especially mm -hmm. read your own magazines or newspapers. I, I I fired reporters back in the day, whose problem was they couldn't get their facts straight. They couldn't do this. They couldn't do that. They didn't that know about anything except journalism, and they didn't read their own newspaper. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so in 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 the same way, to have an editor who I suppose doesn't really know the subject can right. be a problem. And then if if they th if they've they have experience in this particular show or type of show, they might think they know the subject, but they don't. Right, exactly. And the same thing goes with the producers. You know, a lot of the producers are incre incredibly uneducated. A lot of them, I've talked to producers who have pitched shows to me to talk to me about you know. Uh, either working with them or going on the shows, and I've had to spend hours on the phone educating them about what is expected, what you really can get, what's going on in research, what's, how you really investigate this stuff. And some of them have been very uh, interested in finding out because they really want to get it right, and of course they can't, they tend not to be able to sell their shows. And the others really could care less. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they have a show to produce. They uh, think they know what the network, certainly the network tells them what to put on. And that's the other problem is the networks do di dictate sometimes what can and cannot happen on these shows, and it's not always the fault of the production company. Just like in journalism, the managing editor of a newspaper can completely re-edit a reporter's article. Yeah, I was one of them. <laughs> yeah. there, there, were, there were a lot of funny times where I happened to know more about it than the reporter did, but, uh, but yeah, no, that, that does happen. Um, it's funny, you know, we've had several producers, and this has gone on for years, Uh, of shows like this as, as guests from time to time, as I said, Mark Phillips, uh, mm -hmm. and every one of them has agreed with us that it's time to move beyond this stuff and to kind of get a little deeper. Um, we, we think that they're, well, we know because they listen to this show, I, I, so they tell us, um, a highly intelligent, largely untapped audience uh, right. out there that's interested in the paranormal, but they're turned off by all this nonsense. Uh, so I don't know, do you see any movement at all toward that in paranormal TV? I have yet to see that happen. I mean, I, I've, I've talked to some very well-meaning producers, some people who have pitched some really excellent shows. Uh, even at the request of the network, asking for that kind of show, asking for something more intelligent, asking for this, asking for that. And when it comes right down to it, the network says, you know, we're going to go with this other producer. They're doing something just like the other guys. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I'm sure you run into this, too. Ben and I are approached regularly by producers interested in doing something yeah. based on our multiverse work or turning this show into a TV production. It happens 
all the time. But one production company even did a pilot with us. We got another one in the works. Uh, some very weird stuff happened during that pilot, and we've never been allowed to see the video. Um, it was very weird. But in any case, they always come back to us with something like, the networks think we're too intelligent or too deep, in yeah. so many words. Yeah. It, yeah, won't, had, it won't I, sell. I had a colleague of mine just did, did a show recently, and he was told shortly before the show aired that they were not going to put his Ph.D. Or, par- or the word parapsychologist under his name because they didn't want to make him seem any more intelligent than the rest of the ghost hunters out there. <laughs> oh, no. And they also didn't think that the audience would understand the word parapsychologist, so they didn't want to use that. Unbelievable. Well, what, well are they... What are they, I've seen you on, on various shows, and they don't seem to, yeah. uh, you know, put your light under a bushel. I mean, with... yeah, I, you know, it, 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 I've been pretty lucky with producers. I've turned down, actually, turned down a bunch of shows. Oh, so have we? Yeah. And uh, I've had people ask me to be on their shows, and because I'm not clear, you know, because I've seen the tone of the shows and and the editing that might be there, I, I've turned them flat out and said no. And, and sometimes it'll just even be uh, for the first couple of seasons, the show a haunting. It yeah. was on Discovery. Uh, they were calling their production people were calling me asking for cases and such. Of course, they want them for free on top of everything else. Right. But, well, but beyond that, their show started out by talking about how evil is out there, and I said, "Look, you change your show opening, I'll happy, be happy to help you." Mm-hmm. But until you guys change your show, no, no, we can show show cases where uh, people are having friendly ghosts, but they have to start out scared. That's what I was told. Really? Yeah. Well, we had to, we, we have a situation, because I, I wrote a chapter in one of my books about the vampires of Rhode Island. There was a uh, sort of a uh, hysteria right, about that. this sort of thing in New England in the 1700s. It went all the way up to 1895 or so. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it just it was obviously some you know, people had consumption and all this business, and they were digging them up. It was a real weird situation. And this particular producer wanted to have us on, have me on about that, as before Ben's time. And he, he had actors ready to dress up as vampires. He said, I'm not, I'm not doing this. This is not accurate. You know, I mean, my, my other hat is that of a sort of a local historian here, and I'm not going to have a reputation for that. And w- one thing that I, I did agree to do was with the Travel Channel, and uh, it was uh, Curses of New England. And, of course, naturally, and, and uh, I had to fly back from South Carolina to do it. And here we are, naturally, in a historic cemetery in Newport, and uh, they were interviewing me on various cases that had occurred in New England, right? The producer was very displeased that uh, my answers were not conventional. Right. Yeah, I was getting, well, this is why this is, and this is why that is, and, you know, and it wasn't the campfire stuff, you know, you know, kind of stuff you heard in the Boy Scouts. And uh, they were not pleased, so they cut me down to like three minutes in this whole production. <laughs> So, I mean, th- this is what happens when you even get that far. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I did an episode of Unsolved Mysteries many, many years ago where we've flown out for one uh, on a case, a poltergeist case in Wisconsin that I had actually uh, been involved with on the, with a reporter who had covered the case. And originally it started out as something demonic, but even the family didn't think it was demonic. It was just pretty much a, a, pul- a psychokinetic case, and they had some overtones of hysteria and such. Mm-hmm. And they had written about it all over the newspaper, and they brought me out there, and it turned out the director wanted me to talk about demons and how this was demonic and the whole thing. I said, you know, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to tell you exactly what I said in the newspaper article, which is what I think it is. And they weren't even, they didn't even have, uh, they went back to the, to the house. The new family wasn't experiencing anything. They had the previous uh, people on, in shadow on TV. And he, they just, they cut me out completely because they were so pissed off at me because I refused to say what they wanted me to say. Well, yeah, that, that's the same kind of thing. One problem, Lloyd, that I, I have with these shows, and I'm sure you probably agree, well, at least as they're produced and presented, is that they encourage, maybe unwittingly, but I don't know, they probably don't care, they encourage people's involvement in what I consider extremely dangerous practices in the occult. Uh, seeking out the paranormal, in my opinion, can be psychologically, spiritual, and even physically dangerous. What say you? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't really think that way. Um, I think it really, when I talk about, when we talk about the paranormal, we're talking about psychic phenomena, and those are phenomena of normal human beings, living or dead. Yeah. Uh, it just depends on your approach. If you're approaching from a very ritualistic perspective, then there are going to be dangers, and, and that has to do with the practices that you're actually going with. But the phenomena itself and has, it has very little danger other than perhaps psychological that we've seen in parapsychology in the last 130 years. Oh, well, what, what I mean is I, I think that I, I well, actually people have told me that their kids or kids themselves have told me that, that they've been encouraged to use Ouija boards and seances and things have started up in their well, houses well, and all this business. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that's part of the 
partly because of the bad rap the Ouija board has. If you go back 100 years, the Ouija board did not have that situation and was not causing those kinds of problems. It really kind of evolved with certain religious outlooks, but more importantly because of the Exorcist movie, that made the Ouija board a bad thing. Uh, it, it's all the Ouija board is is an adaptation of any uh, you know of any number of practices of spiritualists back in the in the 1800s, and you can make a Ouija board just with letters and a, and a pointer and a glass pointer, which is how people used to do it to begin with. It, it's about the intention. So if you are a kid and you're playing around, oh, I'm going to conjure up a demon, you know you're going to end up with some some bad stuff, whether it's from your unconscious where most of it comes from, or from the outside. And it's not about the board. It's about the intention to think. And frankly, doing the same thing with uh, a digital recorder is no different. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. But I, I you know, I, to me, with the, I've had a lot of bad, bad cases. It's really since the beginning in the early seventies. What started with kids using Ouija boards, and certainly it's the intention. I mean, the thing itself is just a board, you know. But yeah. then again, it's it's um, I've said it's like standing in the middle of the highway. Maybe you get hit, maybe you won't, but who's dumb enough to do that? So I, I always advise people to stay away from that. And seances as well. You don't know what you're talking to, even if it's, even if it's to yourself, you know? So uh, that's, that, I think that we just stumbled on fodder for another show here. But we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll continue to talk about the media here. Um, anyway, from the UFO camp, and I don't know if you agree with me on this here, uh, on, on this particular subject, but I have seen more of a trend toward what might be called a pan-paranormal approach. Generally, uh, I, in the UFO community, with which uh, we rub elbows as much as we do with the ghost people, um, th there seems to be a much more serious approach, in my opinion, than you often see among, you know... Yeah, the, I, I, think, because I think the popular um, investigation of UFO reports goes back much further than television. It yeah. goes back, you know, it goes back to quite a ways back, actually. And you know, if you look at the '70s and people who were doing investigations, what was being talked about after Blue Book ended and such, uh, there was, a, you know, there were a lot of people. MUFON had started up. There were some very serious investigators out there. They were getting some cred on TV news and also in talk shows. Not specific. There were not specifically UFO hunter shows out there. So I think that the amateurization or hobbyist. Uh, movement didn't really get started in the UFO thing at all until much, much later. And, and even then, the serious people about UFO reports, you know, they're looking for evidence, for actual hard evidence, and right. they're looking at it in a different way than the people following the TV shows. Oh, oh no, I agree. It, like it, with the ghost situation, because that's how I started. That was while I was in the seminary, and there was no, the, the term ghost hunting didn't exist. It's a term I can't stand, frankly. It's a media Well, actually, period. that term's been around since the 1800s. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Can you yeah. uh, extrapolate, please? Yeah, I mean, there's a book called Historic Ghost, uh, Ghost Hunters uh, that you can find on um, Google Books. It's a term that Harry Price was known as the ghost hunter in the early 20th century. Oh, right. Well, yeah. All right. He's, he's another issue. Yeah. Yeah. There, was, there, was another, there was another term that was used back in the early, in fact, there was a famous play and then uh, early silent films called The Ghost Breaker. Yeah, uh, Ghost Breaker was, and that was a turn, another that that uh, title was applied to a Bob Hope movie, in fact, and uh, later on, Ghost Breakers. And so, but Ghost Hunter's been around for quite some time. I mean, it's, uh, now that you mentioned, I must be getting senile for sure. Ben always tells me I am in the uh, in the writings of Harry Price. I have seen, I have seen that. Now that you mention it, that's right. Well, thank you. Yeah. I believe something that wasn't true. Uh, but again, the, the uh, I find it very interesting that this pan paranormal approach seems to be coming to the fore in the UFO field. Um, there are many cases that we've started out with that were, you know, quote-unquote ghosts and ended up involving UFOs and greys and things like this. And one wonders, and I don't know if I brought this, you haven't been on this version of the show, but on the CBS show we might have talked about this. One wonders about the context. And uh, in other words, if you see a ball of light hanging over your backyard, it's a UFO, and if you see it in your living room, it's a ghost, you know, to most people. Right, and I'm wondering, right. uh, many of these shows, when they portray these cases, if they're really getting it right, even even with the context, never mind anything else. Well, I, I think there's a lot of that. All that orb stuff that started in the 90s, thanks to yeah. the International Ghost Hunter Society, talking about orbs as being spirits, which was a very illogical leap. I think so, too. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I knew of people in the UFO community who, can, who were talking about or if there's being signs of aliens being around for other dimensional beings. That's sure. Continue. So the context is, is really this, is there. And, you know, and then you have lights or balls of light that are related to ball lightning or earth lights, as they're called sometimes, and they can be videotaped. And, you know, it's a natural phenomenon that 
both seen as UFOs and also as ghosts. Oh, I've seen them myself, yeah. yeah I'm sure I you mean, have, too. So, yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of, there is that kind of crossover in that sense. You know, we don't have too much crossover otherwise with the UFO stuff in parapsychology other than kind of looking at the reports to make sure that they really do fit into what we're talking about versus what uh, the UFO folks are talking about. Uh, huh. you know, I guess I guess if uh, if UFO sightings happen to be a telepathic or psychic projection, that would make it parapsychological. But otherwise, we're not really. Or unless the aliens, of course, are telepathic, then or psychokinetic, then we have to get into that too. Well, if they are really, I mean, it's, it's, you've touched on a nerve with me, Lloyd, because uh, yeah, I have I, I uh, know what they are. I very little. You, I don't know, I shouldn't say use, but I suppose it has its place. But I I don't trust Western epistemology. I don't trust the pigeonholing. Taking things apart, you know, as opposed to putting things together, as is often done in the Eastern mind, I, I, mm-hmm. I just I think that that creates a problem, um, and and that I think leads into what we were saying in the context of a phenomenon, in the context of a situation. I think that that Western epistemology, that pigeonholing, and that that desire to see things out of our own framework can get in the way of defining what something really is. You yeah, follow me? Yeah, I mean, I, the thing about Jalen Hynek used to say that he studied UFO reports, not UFOs. Uh, and yeah. he wasn't sure that all, if, if any of them, were actually nuts and bolts hardware. Yeah, well, well, well this is this is the thing. And, and we had Ted Phillips on. I know we didn't intend to talk about UFOs, but it's all relevant to our discussion. Uh, Ted Phillips, of course, being the fellow in Missouri who has uh, probably the world's largest database of UFO landing evidence mm-hmm. and uh, reports and things of this kind. There are several. There are thousands. Uh, he's collected over, over at least, oh, gee, I, I first heard of him in 1978. And so we're looking at, you know, the guy's been going for going on, uh, you know, at least 35, 40 years here. And he has said that the nature of these phenomena seem to be changing. There is less and less of the metallic nuts and bolts flying saucer type things, you know, landing on legs, and more of the, if you pardon the use of the term, orb type things, balls of light and things of this kind. He talks about a place uh, in Missouri called that is referred to generally as Marley Woods, that's not its real name. That's its, you know, code name because I don't want people to know where it is. And uh, he he was uh, he had us riveted with some of the things that have happened to him there. And Ted is is a I don't know if you know him, but he is a very no. very feet on the ground kind of guy. Doesn't mess around. He's uh you know older even than me. And you now he's he's a, he's a reliable guy as far as I've always seen. So this whole business of. Uh, uh, the the uh, ball of light, the orb in all areas of the paranormal seems to somehow be coming more to the fore, or maybe it's just that more people are watching. Well, except that you know, in the actual cases, there are very few actual orbs seen, and the photographs, for the most part, are photographic errors. In, oh, exactly. Yeah, especially with digital cameras that interpret yeah, things. And yeah, the flashes and such. So, sure. I'm not even sure how much orbs have anything to do with any of the stuff that we're dealing with, certainly when we're talking about psychic phenomena. Oh, no, I know what you mean, but I, I'm just talking in terms of somebody like Ted, uh, who was a yeah, reliable yeah. researcher of oh, great sure, sure. Yeah. and I've seen them myself uh, in certain places, but I don't think that they're spirits, quote-unquote. Now, though, no. I, you know, I have issues with that whole concept, as a matter of fact. So in any case, there, do seem to be, there does seem to be some evolution going on, but at the same time, you wonder if any of this really ever goes anywhere. Do you think that, uh, you know, especially in the context of all these shows that, are, that seem to be, quote-unquote, educating people about this field, that we've really gotten anywhere in the last 130 years? Well, we certainly have in laboratory research and understanding personality variables and understanding some of the things that, that affect or seem to affect environmentally um, highs and lows of the Earth's magnetic field, for example, seem to affect psychic perceptions and even psychokinesis. There are correlations there that are not necessarily cause and effect. So we're actually, we have some understanding of certain things about the human being and our connection to these things. We have a little bit of understanding about how the, uh, some possible ways that ESP might work, some possible ways that PK might work. Uh, certainly that affects what we're doing with haunting investigations, residual haunting type cases, and certainly it affects issues with psychokinesis when that's involved. Well, let, let me just explain to our poor readers, many of whom are stuck in traffic right now and don't need to be any more frustrated than they already are. Psychokinesis, or PK, is essentially the movement of objects by non-physical well, it's, it's, means. You know, or, it's, or, it's the effect of objects, objects and events. So it, it includes psychic healing. It includes, actually, it oh, okay, yeah, in the broadest sense, sure. Yeah, I mean, psychokinesis actually includes uh, moving your own arm. That's mind over matter in, in some respects. Oh, that's true, very true, yeah. yeah. Well, and you're so, expanding my mind here tonight, Lloyd. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, you have extraordinary human performance, not the form of BK, uh, when we really get down to it. Sure. Yeah. Interestingly enough, that's one of the things we've learned, is that the psychology of performance in psychokinesis 
is the same or very similar to the psychology of performance in sports. Hmm. Uh, so trying to get people to be more psychokinetic or to do things even in ESP to some extent, there is a bit of performance psychology in, in both of those things. That, and, it, and it's very similar to what you see in sports psychology. So, yeah, we've, we've learned stuff. Now, in the ghost area, we have learned uh, to look for environmental correlates, but the problem is if we are dealing with actual consciousness after death, and whether you, you look at that yourself depends on whether you, what your philosophical bent happens to be. Uh, we have people in my field who do not believe that consciousness exists outside the body or brain. And they're very, you know, in well, that's the, retro. Yeah, well, no, that's, that's what most of science seems to think right now. You know, well, 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 I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I just, not that I don't have any respect for it. I, I have a lot of respect for science. I have profound respect for it, but... It's scientists I sometimes have problems with. You know, when you paid uh, hundred right. grand to get a degree and somebody comes along and uh, disagrees with what you learned, you naturally are going to resist it. And plus, you know better than anybody probably the politics involved oh, yeah. in things like that. So the, uh, the pursuit of truth is not always the highest uh, priority. No, because it's the, it's the support of their own truth. Is the well, part. yes, exactly. It's because that's where the funding happens to be. <laughs> well, uh, well, that's it. You know, when you get down to it, it's all about bucks. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Um, we mentioned the term serious paranormal research in our intro. Is there, how would you define serious paranormal research? Well, I define it as uh, actually research by people who are educated in the field, whether they're parapsychologists themselves or working alongside uh, with people in the field to some extent. What fields would you include in that? Physics? Theology? Parapsychology para 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 does. Of course, um, because we're trying to look at how human beings or consciousness connects with the physical world, there is an element of physics in there, and naturally we're trying to figure out how, for example, psychokinesis might work from a physics perspective, how, you, how remote viewing works from a physical perspective. It's kind of tough to figure out how ghosts might appear on a physics perspective in a, because we don't know exactly what... We have no way of... Uh, of we, there's no starting point. <laughs> except well, other than quantum physics. And even then, it's purely theoretical and speculative. Well, not, if you've been there and had been hit by a chair thrown by a poltergeist, it's not all that speculative to me. Yeah, I don't that's, know. that's not, but then how do you study that in the laboratory? How do you actually recreate those? Well, why do you have to study in the laboratory? Well, we have people who have been on the show who are, have PhDs after their names. And, I'm, I, and just, you know, in fairness to everyone, some of the dumbest people I know have PhDs after their names. Right. Sometimes right. just meant they went to school. But, I mean, who've said that they, they believe that uh, this field is outside of science. You can't, it's a square peg trying to be, trying to be fit into a round hole. I mean, what say you on that? Well, to some extent, we are dealing with a social science. We're dealing with human beings and human beliefs and human behavior and human performance. And in many respects, psychology is outside of science for that same reason. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, it's not, so, certainly not. You know, parapsychology, parapsychology, while we do consider, you know, incorporate physics in, in the field and biology and, of course, psychology and, and anthropology, it primarily is a social science. And what we're studying is people's experiences of ghosts and poltergeists and things. Now, poltergeist phenomena has physical attributes to it. Tell me about it. But trying to get that to happen so that you can study it under any sort of condition where you can try to figure out what motivated the thing has been very, very difficult. It is very difficult to do. So, well, yeah, well, that's very interesting. Actually, we're, we're a little late for our break here, so we're, we'll be right back on Behind okay. the Paranormal with Paul and Van Eno on WOON 1240 AM in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley with our guest Lloyd Orbach and stay with us, please. I just want to take a moment to uh, thank you for what you've done for St. Jude Hospital over the many years with our radio auction. It's coming up Saturday, June 22nd here on ON, and I want you to help me help the kids at the hospital. There's no better way to do it than make a contribution, but you can listen in and buy some items on the radio auction going on for a number of hours. June 22nd, it begins at 1030 in the morning here Ed Owen, Joe Hyder, hoping you'll help us help the kids at St. Jude Hospital. Okay, I just wanted to tell you about a charity, one of the charities Ben and I have adopted lately, and that is USA Cares. Not very well known in this part of the country, but USA Cares provides financial and advocacy assist assistance to post-9-11 active duty U.S. military personnel, veterans, and their families. So there are never any fees or repayments, and the charity relies on donations from individuals and institutions. So in other words, if, if a, a veteran, a wounded veteran, can't, can't pay the mortgage that month, USA Cares sends out a check. 
It's really as simple as that. Um, and they would like to start a chapter here in Rhode Island. Um, and all we need are seven motivated people. The three main goals of the chapter would be fundraising, outreach, and awareness to military families in need. If you're interested in helping to start this chapter, please contact me at paul at behindtheparanormal.com or at 401-527-5345. USA Cares, great charity. have several other charities as well. Builders Helping Heroes, building a home out in Burlville right now for a wounded veteran from Afghanistan, wounded Marine, and also uh, for uh, in view of our Canadian uh, connections and our wonderful listeners there in Canada, all over Canada, Canadian Veterans Advocacy as well. Check our websites for that. There are links, and please help them out uh, if and when you can. Okay, back to our show now. Lloyd Orbach is our guest this evening, parapsychologist, uh, prolific author, a longtime paranormal investigator and researcher of uh, impressive credentials and credibility, in my opinion, compared with our subject, which is basically uh, UFO, I should say, paranormal television and the shows that are very are ubiquitous out there these days on cable TV particularly. So, Lloyd, uh, we've got a little bit into the nature of the science here involved and uh you were talking uh, i'll let you continue to talk if, if you have uh, further things to say about it about the nature of serious research and why you might not find that on some of these television shows well i mean you're not going to find find it because they apparently don't seem to be terribly interested in presenting uh, anything that gets people to think a little bit <laughs> no, exactly uh you know uh, there's a lot of questions in our field I and mean, the reality is that when you look at this phenomenon there are many questions and often more questions raised than than answers and of course people really want answers right away uh, plus the fact that they also want to be entertained i mean these most of the shows are entertainment shows and that's exactly. a key factor here sci-fi remember started out as a sci-fi channel and Fi stayed for fiction so we're really dealing with presenting shows that are supposed to be entertainment. I, frankly, I don't find them entertaining. I, I'm, I'm kind of bored by those shows. Well, but, you know, I understand that the, their audience is largely made up of teenage girls. Yeah, that's not true. It's <laughs> not true? Okay. I, not, you know, that's what I've heard. I mean, maybe, maybe that's who the buying public is, but certainly the people who are out there uh, as investigators and starting the groups and such uh, that are out there, they're like in their 30s and 40s and they're uh, general, you know, often, I don't know how many what the percentage of male versus female is, but... Uh, there's a very, very white, <laughs> yeah. uh, middle, middle and lower middle class uh, centric kind of uh, demographic there for at least for those folks. That they seems very have, true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they have to have enough um, money to be able to go to these conferences and things, these fan bases. But they're, they're very similar. You know, I, I got to say, I, I am a Star Trek fan. And I was around since the very beginning of Star Trek fandom in the 70s. Uh -huh. the second yeah. ever Star Trek convention and the third one, too, in New no York. No kidding. Okay. And... And a lot of the, you know, the stereotype, stereotypical fandom stuff that we saw, the, the people you saw on the Saturday Night Live skit with, with William Shatner, you know, saying "Get a life." <laughs> it's the same. It's the same people. It's the same kind of people. Oh my goodness! So they buy into what they see on TV as some form of reality, or that is their reality. And I can't tell you the number of people that I've met who have said negative things to me because I have questioned. Now forget about actually calling some of these shows on what they've done wrong because I've questioned things on the show. It's like a religion. It's a, it's a fan-based thing. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. my uncle was a soap opera director and uh, it was true that some people got so involved in the soaps that if they met one of the actors on the street, they thought the actor was the character. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, that, that happens frequently. I've, I've heard uh, from people I know that that's happened to. Yeah, yeah. That's extremely so, interesting. Well, you know, now that you mention it, uh, some, we, we get a lot of, we have tons and tons of emails, and we have a lot of open line shows in order to try and answer them. As a matter of fact, um, uh, when Ben is not around, uh, I might uh, tap you as a co-host, because we've, we've done that with Rosemary Allen Guiley and Bill Burns sure. uh, next week, because we get so many that, that they can be topical. We can uh, categorize them, so uh, I'll, I'll give you a fair warning about that. But we received one, or actually we received one's, um, well, yeah, one last week and one the week before, and just about once a week, somebody asked, how come you guys aren't on one of these shows? And I, there was well, one, we were approached before it started, uh, but I just, it just didn't sound right to me. But I said, you know, we are, uh, well, how come you're not at, or at one of these these conferences now, and, and very, very occasionally you'll be invited to speak at a conference, but, you know, we spoke in England last September, but that wasn't a conference, it was just us. But the basic reason is they don't like what we have to say. Yeah, for me, there, there's uh, there's two elements. One is that is one element, um, and it's contrary to what they you know. I have a lot to say that is contrary to the TV shows, and I've spoken on a couple of conferences on kind of parapsychology for ghost hunters. Yeah, 
And I've, I've made, you know, I haven't made that many comments specifically at directing the shows, but, you know, talking, even just talking about the idea of, of working in the dark and how bad that is is an observational sure. process. Sure, yeah. And that that doesn't match anything in the field, in, you know, scientifically or otherwise. Right. That in itself was enough to get a lot of negative comments for me. <laughs> it kind of got me... Uh, kicked out of uh, of the queue for doing some of those conferences. Oh, I hear you. I hear. I don't know how Andrew Nichols does it. He's a uh, Dr. Andrew Nichols. He's a parapsychologist. Yeah, I know, Andy, as you. Oh, I know I've known Andy for years. Oh yeah, and a wonderful guy. We have some great shows with him. And uh, he said that essentially the same thing. He's generally invited to these things, but I guess he he says he feels like he's you know talking to, you know the deaf ears as they say. It. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, you know, and the biggest problem is that uh, this is a bigger problem than just these these TV shows. But what really kind of bothers me more than almost anything else is that so many of these people seem to think that by watching a TV show, they are properly trained to do anything. Oh, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I can tell you that I'm pretty sure that Jason and Grant, in their profession as plumbers, would not want people watching a do-it-yourself TV show and then hanging out a shingle as plumbers, professional. Nope, nope. Well, that, well that, now we can get into HGTV, and people are actually doing that too. Well, they, so. but they, you know, but there are legal issues covering that. Sure, there are. Yeah, you, can't, you have to go through certain certifications to work in people's homes. Absolutely, you, you can. You have to be licensed to the contract. Now we know that there are bad contractors out there and bad plumbers. Well, guess what? There are very, very bad investigators out there. I'm just waiting for the lawsuits. I mean, sooner or later, somebody's going to figure out that, that there there can be paranormal malpractice or something, and along you'll come, and then the insurance companies will sell insurance for it. It's amazing. But uh, our basic, the few times we have spoken, or I have spoken at any of these conferences, uh, my basic message uh, orbits around the word "don't." You know, you don't know what you're dealing yeah. with. You know, you're, you're going to, especially, it really makes me cringe when they start to counsel people. You know, uh, because, it, and, at least in my experience, and as you say, it, it is a social science. What is happening is intimately. Uh, connected with the people who are having the experiences, in my my experience, my well, opinion. Well, remember that, that half the time what they're doing is following TV shows and sending the people out of the house, and all they're doing the next day is telling them, yeah, your house is haunted, here's the evidence, see you later. Yeah, so it's ridiculous. Happy. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually worse than almost than Yeah, so... Alone. So anyway, I guess p- people will have to listen to the show and not necessarily hear all of us at these conferences. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so... Uh, and uh, and you, have, you have shows like, you know, and like Ghost Hunters. I mean, Ghost Hunters, how many experts are there having Ghost Hunters? I don't know. I don't usually watch it. They, they don't. They don't have experts. Well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll come clean here. The, in '03, before they started, uh, I did receive. They, they had read what book was out at that time? Uh, my book, Footsteps in the Attic, which mm-hmm. presented the multiverse approach and at least how I see things and how I've been doing things and all this. And they were interested in that and uh, wanted to know, if, you know, kind of put out some feelers of uh, wanted to sort of get involved with what they were doing. And you know, I just Ben and I don't join groups. First of all, the main purpose of groups is to keep other people out, and uh, there are all sorts of feuds and intrigues that are the greatest right, uh, right. pleasure in life for some of these people. No, not all. And there, there, there are some some very fine and sincere people out there, but it doesn't mean that they know anything. So anyway, this never worked out for us, and we don't join things. So anyway, and uh, the, the local uh, ghost hunting community, if you wouldn't want to say, in, in the, the uh, southeastern New England here is not wild about us because of what we say, and they don't particularly, because we don't, we don't have them on the show, because they all say the same things, and there's really not a lot worth hearing, in my opinion. So anyway, that's a story with that. So you, you feel our pain, in that. although it's not pain, I, I'm rather relieved not to be involved in that. So, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I, tur- I turned down a couple of shows early. I turned down Paranormal State for a couple of reasons. Well, the first time it was logistical, it was before they actually aired. After, we- after I saw them on the show, you know, saw the show, it's like I don't want to be involved in a show that talks about demons so much. So, yeah, exactly. Know, well, yeah, very wise. Now, what about movies? Uh, is it the same crew who would go to... Uh, yeah, I- I'm not really familiar with them. Uh, was it a paranormal incident or something like that or... Uh, paranormal activity. Paranormal activity, right, right. I, you know, I don't know. I haven't really had a chance to talk to any of these, too many of these folks about some of the movies they're out. I think for the most part, at least they're savvy that the movies don't, rep- you know, are not necessarily based on true stories or, or represent. For at least the ones that say that they're not. Let's face it. These days, and for the last 40 years, if they said a movie is based on a true story, they can take the synopsis of the story and then write a script from that that has nothing to do with the original story. Oh, that's and true. That's, that happened with the movie The Entity. You yep. know that so much of The Entity never happened in reality. My exactly. Barry, yeah. Yep. My friends Barry Taff and uh, Terry Gaynor were involved in that case. Barry was telling us all about it on the show. Yeah. 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 So you, you know, and these days, all you see often see inspired by a true story, which is a really interesting thing, and that means that somebody saw somebody talking about it or read an article, uh, an interview with somebody who had an experience, and all of a sudden 
They take, I had a ghost in the house and I was scared, and they turn it into whatever else, and they can say it was inspired by a true story. Anything goes. Well, you know, in a way, I had a connection with, with the, probably the first time that happened in, in, in any major way in the context in which we're talking about. That was the Exorcist film. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, one of my greatest mentors was Father John Nicola, the Jesuit priest who was the technical advisor for that. Until the day he died, he regretted having done it. And uh, we had long conversations in the uh, early 70s about, about how they took what was based on a real case that he was involved with and turned it into this disaster right. from a theological and parapsychological point of view. Right. And uh, that, that, that's what got me. I, I swear that's what got me thrown out of the seminary. They didn't like me being involved in that because uh, of what it did to the, for the PR, for the church. And I just said, why don't you just tell people what you believe, whether it's scientifically right or not, just tell people what mm-hmm. you believe. This is what it is. You know, we, you know, don't worry about it. We've got to, but no, they clammed up, and they still clam up, and, and that's what makes everybody so curious about the thing. Right, right. So yeah. in any case, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was one of those strange things. Uh, Lloyd, before we end, we're burning up this hour here. Great conversation. I wanted to give you a chance to talk about your books and your website and let people, folks know where they can find out more about you. Sure, sure. Uh, well, they can go to Amazon and run my name, Lloyd Auerbach. It's Lloyd with one L, by the way, uh, and they'll find four of my books out there. Uh, the most recent one is called The Ghost Detective's Guide to Haunted San Francisco, which was co-written by my late colleague, Annette Martin, a psychic. And it's kind of like coming along with us on, uh, it doesn't cover every haunted place in San Francisco. It's really several of our favorite cases and in-depth. And it's more like taking you along on a ride with us. So you get an idea of what we did at these cases, including some transcripts of uh, things we talked about. So it's a kind of a fun book. Uh, my website is mindreader.com. That's a great place to start. I got a lot of free articles there. Uh, also links out to most of the major organizations in parapsychology, in and around parapsychology. Uh, I just put up a YouTube channel last week with a lot of my older and some of my more recent uh, TV stuff, including a video that I had of early research on out-of-body experiences conducted at the American Society for Psychical Research back in the early 80s. Oh, yeah. I was pretty active in that. Yeah, It's a 25-minute video with Alex Tannis and Carlos Osis. Wow. And it's a very cool thing, and I kind of tell people they have to kind of look carefully to spot me in the background once or twice. I'll check that out. Uh, Considerably uh, more youthful than you are today, I might say, Uh, as as I might say the same thing about myself. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Literally, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I also want to mention that um, I also teach courses, which you can find out about from my website. Cool. Okay, very good. Now, just, uh, I suppose, our final question this evening. What, uh, maybe it's not the final question. We have some time. Well, a little bit of time. All right. Uh, what, what do you see? Now, we touched on this before, but what do you see as the future of paranormal, I suppose, lack of a better term, paranormal entertainment? You know, whether it be TV or films. I mean, is it really going to go anywhere? Or is it going to stay like this? Uh, you know, I think until somebody, somebody can find sponsors who are willing to put the money up for some more intelligent programming. Yeah then I think we're stuck in a rut. Um, I, I'm working with one production company about uh, with, uh, on a comedy type thing. I'm hoping that that kind of goes because huh. this time we made fun of this stuff. You mean like Ghostbusters or something? Uh, not exactly. I can't really say much more about that. Okay, but, oh, no, I understood. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's more of a spoof thing than anything else. And okay. The, as, you know, really, producers need to take a chance. I think networks need to take a chance. They took a chance when they ran in Ghost, Ghost Hunters to begin with. They took a chance with some of the early shows like Sightings and things like that. Yeah. There's precedent for big ratings on major networks for shows like Unsolved Mysteries and Sightings, shows that did a really great job, at least for a good part of their runs. And you can present things intelligently. You know, Brian Green did a great job in his Nova series about the universe. Exactly. It, it, it's possible to do science in a fun intelligent way, but you've got to actually have people involved who know what they're talking about, but who also know how to approach the general public. And there are more than a couple of us in the field of parapsychology who are able to do that. Uh, so I think that maybe the future is the web, unfortunately. You know, I, at this point, it may be that, that that's where the energy gets put. But, of course, at the same time, that's where every ghost hunting team is putting up their TV pilot. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. That they've so, made themselves half the time. Yeah. yeah. So getting through the crap is really going to be the most difficult thing for any consumer. And all I can say is that if they really want to know what's going on, start with a reliable source like the Parapsychological Association or the best The best one is the Rhine Research Center. Yes, I agree. Yeah. R-H-I-N-E. People can join that. They're a great lecture. If you're a member of the Rhine Center, they run lectures every other week, and they, they're putting those up archived so that members get to get, get to actually watch the the lectures so that are going out to the public. And people can actually watch them live via webcast, too. Yes. So Rhine is, uh, is one of the best places. 
and they'll tell, they'll put you straight to the, the right people and the right folks, the right names. The Parapsychological Association has a list of the members, and you can look at their names and who they are and even get recommendations for other books from some of them. So we're out there. It's just a matter of looking for us rather than watching the TV shows for us. Okay. Do you see more of an interdisciplinary approach coming down the road in the future? I mean, we touched on this before with uh, Western epistemology, you know, pigeonholing things and being, in my opinion, over-specialized. And then you have people like uh, Dr. Amit Gatswami, who is a, yeah. a, a physicist, mystic, uh, a really interdisciplinary kind of renaissance guy, you know, who's saying we need to spread our wings and embrace many different fields, you know, as, as I would suggest any journalist do. Right. Maybe, well, you know. I think that, you know, we're dealing with, in parapsychology, we're dealing with phenomena of consciousness. And yeah. The consciousness studies kind of is what we're doing. We're, just, we're doing one part of consciousness studies. And in reality, we try to be as interdisciplinary as possible, but consciousness studies itself, which is really, I think, the future of all of this, needs to be extremely interdisciplinary, but that means finding researchers in each of the fields who are willing to, at this point, unfortunately, stake their academic reputations on working on the subject. That's the problem. And it is a problem. Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, if we had somebody like a Richard Branson, who's a maverick himself, if Richard Branson said, hey, these guys are all mavericks, I'll support them doing this sort of thing, then I think the future of science would be taking a very big leap. No, I think you're right. Uh, among lawyers, journalists, and probably scientists, I think unless you are a renowned eccentric, you really can't get away with a lot. You know, That's right. A renowned eccentric of, of considerable years and tenure as well. Uh, but but what, I, I, do, you, do you happen to see any... Well, I'm thinking of people like John Mack at Harvard, you know, the fellow who was a U.S. Oh, yeah, 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 was. abduction researcher who was uh, very high academic regard, at least until he started doing that, but he uh, had a tough time of it later on, later, later killed in a Tra traffic accident, if you believe yeah, in the reports. Yeah, you know, I've got to give Northwestern University credit where it's my alma mater. Yeah. Uh, because J. Allen Hynek was the chairman of the astronomy department. Right, and right. Never, not only never bothered him about his UFO stuff, he gave the opening lecture to every incoming freshman class. Oh, I didn't realize that. I, I, I met him. I just met him briefly before he died. But J. Allen Hynek, of course, being the fellow hired, was it the Colorado study? Uh, well, he actually was probably was the, the uh, astronomical uh, consultant, the astronomer consultant to Project Blue Book. That's right, to the Air Force. And yeah, later, Force. you know, did, didn't believe in UFOs, later came to the conclusion that there was a lot to it and became a right. major fellow in the... As a matter of fact, he made a um, cameo appearance. A lot of people don't realize this in uh, one of the final scenes, <clears throat> excuse me, of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. That's Spielberg correct. Spielberg does things like that. Well, uh, I mean, Heineck actually came up with that categorization. He came up with Close Encounters in the first time. Oh, you go. That's right. He did. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I mean, Northwestern completely supported him in doing what he was doing because they knew he was an academic whiz. They knew what he was talking about. He, he looked at the evidence. He was very careful in how he talked about it. He wasn't afraid to go into those areas. And fortunately, the university really supported him in doing that. There's not a lot of that happening otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's, uh, let's end with uh, I keep saying these are the final questions, but I keep coming up with them. What, this is um, something that bothers me a great deal. Uh, there's a fellow locally here who's very well known and has a big website, and uh, we, he and I disagree on this vehemently, and that's involving children in the paranormal hobby. You know? And uh, yeah, I, I think that is a really, really dumb idea. Uh, let alone, you know, simply because what it could do to them psychologically. You know, they'd be right. hiding under their beds yeah. for the next five years. You know, what say you yeah. on that? I think that, I think you're right on that. I mean, I, I don't see any real um, psychic danger per se, but I, I actually think there's a psychological issue, and there are other elements that are involved with taking kids on any sort of any situation where there might be potential physical danger as well yeah. from the environment. And I think it's really pretty risky. Uh, okay. On multiple levels, I would never take little kids on those. You know, it's one thing to go like uh, we have the USS Haunted Aircraft Carrier Museum here in the Bay Area, which is haunted, and kids do routinely do overnight there. You know, the Boy Scouts do them, uh, local schools do them, and they'll tell them ghost stories, and the stories are based on actually stuff people have been seeing on the ship. But you know, they tell ghost stories around campfires and other cir circumstances too. But they don't take them ghost hunting on the ship. Well, that's probably wise because first of all, moving around on a ship, as you know, I, mean, I, I was at sea on a Coast Guard vessel, and it took me a good couple of days to learn how to navigate those ladders and stuff, well, stairs, we call them ladders, yeah, ladders without yeah. breaking my neck, you know. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, they, they have tourists running around the ship all the time, so that's sure. not really that much of a big deal for people. Well, I suppose but, not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, on the, uh, there's a matter, too, that I, always, that I wanted to ask you as well. Uh, you brought up, I know we're jumping around here, but 
You brought up something I found was very interesting, uh, the notion of the poltergeist activity, which both of us have experienced firsthand. And I always kind of got the impression that it isn't necessarily an entity doing these things. There could, uh, that, that it simply, uh, well, in, in my interpretation, and I'm not, not a scientist as you are, uh, that you have various energies that are um, sort of giving and taking here in this environment, and that... Uh, no, no, it's actually not energies either. It, it's a living person. You know, the poltergeist cases, the majority of poltergeist cases have been pinned down to a living agent, in the location. Well, I, I've never found that to be true. I, mean, I shouldn't say I've never found it to be true, but I, I, don't, I don't think that that's good enough, frankly. But again, that's my own experience. And, you know, you're the guy with the parapsychology degree. Well, you know, uh, Bill Roll, there have been so many people in my field who have done research on poltergeist cases, hundreds of poltergeist cases. And you know, granted, there are some cases where I have cases where there's physical object movement, which uh, is related to spirit, spirits and the apparent ghosts in the place. But those are completely different in terms of the kinds of movement we have compared to poltergeist cases, which are very chaotic and destructive and very psychologically bound. They're, they're related to a living person. And, we, and, you know, here's the thing that we've tested. This is a hypothesis. Clearly it's a hypothesis. But you can test it in a number of different ways, and it has been tested over and over again in these kinds of cases. We're working with uh, finding the individual who is, under, who is disturbed or stressed out, because it's often just plain stress, and working with them just minimally causes the phenomena to stop. So if it is entities or some energies there, you know, I don't, it's very difficult to see how working with a living person to, to deal with their stress or help them get help for their stress could cause the phenomena or the energy to stop otherwise. Well, this, I don't know. I have found, and this, I'm thinking particularly the worst one I ever dealt with, 1975, and it was in New Haven, Connecticut. It was just after that Bridgeport mess uh, the previous year. There seemed to be an entity and, of course, what these things do, in my opinion, is to feed upon, as you say, someone who's stressed or, or even the situation in the family. And I, I have found them, in my interpretation, literally farming certain individuals and families and moving from one individual to the other. Uh, but, again, this is, this is fodder for another show here, but, but it's excellent. Yeah. Just our, our final, very, very last question. On the matter of gadgets... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I really have a, I don't know, I, I, I sort of laugh at those who, you know, and this is all over the TV shows, they have their, you know, thermal instruments, and they have their electromagnetic field meters and all this stuff, and I just said, boy, when I started, we're lucky we had, you know, re, uh, sort of a tape recorder, reel-to-reel tape recorder, right. and all this stuff. Uh, what about all these gadgets? I mean, how much validity is there to really, really to, to, to uh, well, let, let's say, EMF meters? You know, EMF is read EMF, and the, the question is, does when somebody has an experience, is there an unusual or anomalous EMF reading that that might correlate to the person's experience? It doesn't necessarily correlate to phenomena, but it correlates to something connected to their experience. And the, the use of environmental sensors is appropriate, provided that they're used appropriately, and the appropriate use is to give them context. You know, any of these devices, they don't pick up ghosts. So if you're using any of them, and let's say that you have five different kinds of devices, temperature reading, temperature sensors, different kinds of EMF reading, different uh, phases of, or different types of electromagnetic fields, if they're all going off at one time, there's very little that you should set them all off. But that's still just an anomaly. If someone sees a ghost at the time that they're all going off, then you have a context, at least the story behind the anomaly. It doesn't mean that the ghost is causing those things. It may mean that whatever's causing those things, those readings, is also causing the person to see a ghost. Well, there's a, there's a third show we, we've got fodder for. I'm <laughs> planning yeah. ahead here. Okay, well, uh, Lloyd, it's been a fascinating conversation, delightful, uh, delightful conversation as well, and I learned a lot. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Paul. We'll be in touch uh, off the air, and we'll set up some more shows. Sounds great. Excellent. Okay, folks, Behind the Paranormal. Stay tuned for the city council meeting at 7 o'clock, and uh, if you can get through that, then uh, it's going to switch to ON2 at 8 o'clock. And um, we've got uh, the Boston Bruins and... The Pittsburgh Penguins at 8 o'clock, and uh, we have listeners in both cities, so I will not express any opinion. All right. Ben should be back in uh, two weeks to three weeks, certainly. He's taking a summer course, and he sends everyone his best. Now, of course, what I want to do, too, is uh, remind you about our charity, uh, USA Cares. It's usacares.org if you want to check it out. And also there's a link on our site, behindtheparanormal.com. So let's... Uh, uh, this is all the same color tonight, so I'm a little bit confused. Okay, anyway, so certainly many thanks to our producer, the wise and wonderful Steve Bianchi, who still looks like King Umberto of Italy. Next week, June 10th, we will welcome UFO researcher Ryan Mullahy.
one of the organizers of this year's Exeter UFO Festival on August 31st, for discussion of UFOs over New Hampshire. Not sure whether Ben and I will be there this year. Usually we have a broadcast booth there, but we will see. And on our CBS Radio edition on Sunday, June 9th, in Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Windsor, and Seattle, Vancouver, and on Radio.com, Ben and I will once again take the hour to respond to the many thought-provoking and intelligent questions and comments on many paranormal topics that continue to pour in from our listeners. And we do, do encourage you to call in or write in uh, your various paranormal questions. And we, we do have a lot of those shows, and we'll try to get to them as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, if people, I just wanted to make a comment, too, that if people need immediate help, uh, you're welcome to contact us. I uh, can't promise uh, anything, but we do, usually someone screens our email, but when we uh, do have one that is uh, of extreme, uh, sort of an emergency nature, it is sent directly, generally to me, and I do try to respond. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to have a very interesting show on our CBS edition, and that's going to include someone locally here, uh, one of our uh, listeners from Woonsocket, uh, Rhode Island, uh, Donna Fantoni, who answers many of our questions and has called in about uh, various um, experiences that, uh, uh, sort of the out-of-the-body thing. We're going to have listeners um, uh, set up to talk about out-of-the-body experiences uh, on this particular show and to sort of get the, the perspective from the people who have received, uh, who have had these experiences rather than from somebody with a Ph.D., and that should be very interesting. We'll tell you more about that next week. So uh, we do encourage, of course, uh, BehindTheParanormal.com. We have over 500 podcasts, recordings of past shows from the past six years, including special shows, uh, shows from ON here, shows from CBS uh, that Ben and I have done on every conceivable paranormal topic. And uh, what we do point out that we have the Rendlesham UFO series, which was considered a rather history-making series, the first one to deal with that amazing case in England. So anyway, we will leave you this evening with a quote from some wise but unknown soul, person or persons unknown. Quote, we all die. The goal isn't to live forever. It's to create something that will. Unquote. I'm Paul Eno. Thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. We'll see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.